Howdy, y'all. Future Brad, October 2022, Brad here. Just wanted to record a new introduction to this video that I recorded way back in May 2021. And it's good, but um, but Lesson 8.2 is very long. It's about an hour long. And as I was previewing it for this course, I just realized, you know, it's, it's a lot of information. It's important information. And it's just a lot to take in in that period of time. So I um, edited it, tried to make it a little bit shorter, and added some music, and added some little interludes here, added a, a rap, actually, just to try and entertain you, keep your mind fresh as you're going through it, and also broke it into two parts um, and added subtitles and that kind of stuff so that you can follow along easily. And added also some references to Matisse Yahoo. Uh, so in the next lesson, the next, uh, yeah, the next lesson, we'll focus on Matisse Yahoo, this contemporary reggae rapper, which is part of why I did the rap here. It seemed appropriate. So I added in some references that are tying the covenants to some of his music and tying some of the scriptures into his, his lyrics. And we'll dive more deeply into that in the next lesson, but I thought this would be a nice way to tie it together. So anyway, I hope you enjoy it and I hope you take lots of notes and take lots away from it as we dive into the Jewish scriptures and traditions. Namaste and welcome back to uh, lesson eight. We're going to continue with our study of the Jewish tradition and have a look at the Jewish scriptures, the Ketuvim, Navim, and the Torah, what's known as the Tanakh. So just a quick snapshot of some Jewish scriptures, primarily focusing on the Jewish covenants and a little bit of the, the Jewish story from the Hebrew scriptures and some of the various traditions, which then will, will lead into a closer look at Moses and then some contemporary figures. So the Jewish scriptures, the Hebrew scriptures, are most commonly referred to as Tanakh. Tanakh actually stands for three different sections, Ta, Na, and Ka. Um, ta standing for the Torah. And the Torah is literally translated as teaching or instruction, but is more commonly translated or referred to as the law. Then the next section of the Tanakh are the Navim. So the Navim are the prophets. And then the Ketuvim. So Ketuvim are things like the Psalms, Proverbs, so things that are um, that are stories but prim or hymns, those sort of things. Sort of poetry, poetic writing, Song of Solomon, Song of Songs, that sort of thing. So together these constitute 24 books all written in Hebrew that constitute the Tanakh. The Torah is also commonly referred to as the Pentateuch. So Torah is a Hebrew word. Pentateuch is a Greek word. So penta meaning five and tuk meaning book. So the five books. They're named in Hebrew for the first word of each one of the books. So Bereshit, the first word, uh, the first line of the Hebrew scriptures, Bereshit bara Elohim, Hashemayim va'et Eretz. So in the beginning is usually how Bereshit, this great Rabbi Rashi from the 11th century translates it when God began to create or when God began to separate or unfold the, the cosmos. But most commonly we know it in English as in the beginning. So be, preposition, um, Bereshit, Bereshit, in the beginning. In English, we often refer to it as, it's most commonly known as Genesis, which is a Greek, a Greek word meaning beginning. Next are the Shemot. Again, in Hebrew, each one of the books of the Bible are known by just the first word of the book. So in some cases, like Bereshit, it, it also is consistent with the theme and the topic of the text, but sometimes not so much. So Shemot just simply means names uh, because that's the first, the first word of the, the text. In English, it's more commonly known as Exodus, which again is a cognate of a Greek word, ex hodos. Hodos meaning the way or the path, and ex meaning out, so the way out, so this sort of going out. Or, so it tells the story of the, of the Hebrews' journey out of slavery in Egypt and journeying towards the, the lands of Israel. Next is Vayikra, and he called, which is commonly known in English as Leviticus, related to the Levites. So this is, you know, details about the Levite priesthood and the different rules governing ritual behavior, ritual practice, livelihood, that sort of things. Um, Bemindar, or numbers, meaning in the desert. Devarim, the words, or more commonly in English, the Deuteronomy, which is, again is a Greek cognate. Deutero meaning second, and nomos meaning law, so the second law. 
The Torah is at least from the 7th century BCE. Now, when I say it's from then, I mean, that's when it was uh, written down. I don't think we have any copies or portions of text that are that old, but we have evidence that it was written down around that time. But the stories are much older, and the things that take place in the stories are much older. For example, the story of Moses possibly takes place under Ramses II. So 13th century BCE is when Ramses II was a pharaoh of Egypt. Moses or Moses is an Egyptian name. Ramses, uh, also an Egyptian name. So Ramses means the son of Ra. Uh, Ra is the sun god and Moses meaning the son of Mo, which is the moon god, the son of the sun and the son of the moon. Um, the Torah it was passed down as an oral tradition, so it was not written down until quite late. It was in expected that every Jewish person would memorize the entirety of the Tanakh, you know, from memory, commit the entire thing from memory. In fact, it was kind of forbidden to writ it, write it down. Well, not so much forbidden to write, it, to write it down as it was just improper because the idea was you want to you want people to not just learn the text and just know what it says it's not like other books but you want them to really want the text to become a part of their understanding of themselves and so that you want um, your children primarily to memorize the entire text so that it affects everything that they do, right? It's always right there in their mind. They don't have to go and look it up and see what does the, what does the Bible say about X or Y because they have the entire thing memorized word for word in Hebrew. So then the question is, well, why, if that's the case, that makes sense, right? So then why was it ever written down? If, the, if it was passed down and seen as improper, or at least not ideal to write it down because you want people to memorize. There's no point in writing it down if you have the whole thing memorized, right? Then why would they start writing it down at all? And the answer to that is basically there are several different periods where, you know, the community was threatened. The, the community as an entirety was the survival of the community was threatened. For example, in the first century BCE during what's known as the Maccabean Revolt, Pompeii, who was, uh, we know Pompeii as the city of Pompeii, but the city of Pompeii was named after a general, Pompeii, who, um, who basically just ravaged the, the Jewish people and went and as part of their revolt against the, uh, against the empire, seeking freedom and self-rule and independence, freedom from the Roman Empire. The Romans didn't like that because they wanted their taxes and whatnot, and so they put down this revolt. But they did it in a in a particularly brutal way that n nearly wiped out, you know, almost all of the men in the nation of Israel at that time. So then, if the entire, if the, you know, the elders and everybody who has the text memorized, you know, begin to disappear, then the community is threatened, and so is the text. Right? There aren't enough people who know the text. So then what happened was there was a group of Jewish men, primarily men, probably exclusively men, we're not sure, but known as the Essenes who then went off and sort of, um, you know, secluded themselves in various places such as caves. So what's now known as the Dead Sea Scrolls come from this community of the Essenes where they just went into these caves in order to write down the scriptures, right? They're hiding more or less so that they can get the text written down before they're killed or wiped out by the Roman Empire so that it can be passed on, so that the tradition isn't lost, so that the text isn't lost. Because you can certainly teach your kids to memorize the entire text, but you can't teach them if you're not around and if your uncles and family members aren't around. Here's an image of the, of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Not a very good image, but you can have a look at that online if you want. So just some traditional dates. So the, the Exodus that's described in the book of Exodus takes place, like I said before, sometime around 1300 BCE. So during the time of Ramses II. King David is said to have lived sometime around 1000 BCE, 900 or 1000 BCE. These are both statues carved by Michelangelo. So Christian artists, typically in Jewish culture, it's not proper to depict these characters in this way, it's seen as somewhat as of a graven image or something like that. So most of the images that we're familiar with of Jewish figures come from Christian artists. Solomon's temple was constructed sometime around 950 BCE. So Solomon was the son of David. So it was Saul and David and then Solomon. And Solomon built what's known as Solomon's temple, the temple of Israel. It was destroyed 
then in 587, somewhere around then by the Babylonians. Then the second temple was constructed sometime in the 6th century, or at least begun in the 6th century BCE, thanks to a donation given by Cyrus the Great, the Cyrus the Emperor of Persia the, the, that took over most of the known world at that time. Then the second temple was also destroyed in the year 70 CE, this time by the Romans and this time by General Titus. And if you visit Rome, as I know many of you probably have done, but if you visit present day Rome, you can go to the Roman Forum and in the Roman Forum, right next to the Colosseum, um, and you'll see there the Ark of Titus or the Ark of Triumph of Titus. So Titus is it's, a, it's an arc, right? Like the Arc, of Triomphe in, uh, Arc de Triomphe in Paris, but this is an Arc de Triomphe in Rome. Depicting Titus's conquering of Jerusalem and the sacking of the temple, and you can see in this little bas-relief, just a photograph from that arc, where they're looting the temple, right? So they've, they've they massacred everybody that was in the temple, desecrated the temple, performed certain rituals there, uh, and then looted it, taking the gold, gold menorah and all the wealth and things. So that was destroyed in 70 CE and has yet to be rebuilt. So there are certainly a number of Jews today who would like to see that temple reconstructed in Jerusalem today. We could just talk more about that at some other time. The current year, 2021, when I'm recording this, the current year, according to the Hebrew calendar, is 5,781. So that's counting back to the Garden of Eden and the, the events depicted in Bereshit in the, in the book of Genesis. So the, the Tanakh is critically important, and as important as it was to, at one time, to memorize the entire text, now that the text uh, is preserved in scrolls, and these scrolls are um, regarded as centrally important um, sacred objects, you know, per, treated with a great deal of reverence, as you can see here. And oftentimes, Jews will read, will not even touch the scrolls in order to partly, you know, preserve them, not to damage them with the oils and things, dirt and things on your, on your fingers. And so here's just a, a number of different readings of the, of the Tanakh, of the Tanakh scrolls. Um, Jewish uh, boys and girls, when they reached an age of maturity during, during puberty, then they will typically go through a ceremony known as a bar mitzvah or a bat mitzvah, um, so for, you know, boys and girls. And this is a coming of age ritual. The idea is that, uh, that a boy will enter his bar mitzvah or a girl will enter her bat mitzvah and as a girl or as a boy, but then leave that ceremony as a man or as a woman. So this is an important ritual, not only of uh, coming of age psychologically, all the sort of crossing and dwelling that we talked about in the theory and method section early in the course, right? This is an important transition stage where boys and girls, you know, feel the responsibility and the weight of becoming adults, where they recognize the importance of demonstrating their connection to the heritage, the, that they are able to read Hebrew um, and recite some Hebrew and read from the scrolls in Hebrew as a sign of their commitment to the Jewish tradition. So here's just a number of images of boys and girls reading um, and carrying the scrolls as part of their bar mitzvahs and bat mitzvahs. This is an image uh, from 2006. Uh, most of these images I got from one of my mentors, Harvey Cox at, at Harvard. I'm not entirely sure where all of them came from before then, but this is a, an image of what's called storytelling. It's basically a, a youth group. So a Jewish youth group, um, you know, teenagers who are performing to acting out, they're dramatizing, right, the, the story of the Tower of Babel. So you can see they're taking the scroll and carrying it up like the Tower of Babel, this ba tower that's being built up to, to the heavens. To fill in a number of observant Jews will, will um, wear straps around their arms at certain, usually, you know, certain times of day and that sort of thing is part of ritual, uh, ritual prayer and ritual meditation, that sort of thing. Reading from the Torah and wearing phylacteries, this uh, the little boxes on there. You can see here that the man has a box on his forehead so that the Torah can be close to his mind, right? Close to close to his mind and also on his biceps so that the Torah will be in his muscles and in his body and likewise so that the that the Torah is something that's that's embodied right so embodying the scriptures 
The following musical interlude is brought to you by Brad's Editing Service. Brad's Editing Service, because it's hard to pay attention. Though my name is Brad, these kids call me Dad. I like to rap, and I ain't half bad. I like to beatbox even though I can't. But that don't stop me in my khaki pants. Much of the Hebrew scriptures, at, at least particularly for our purposes and this course, as we're giving this quick overview snapshot of the Jewish tradition, are organized around various covenants. So there are a number of covenants that you know began in the book of Genesis and continue. And so I just wanted to give you a brief overview of what a covenant is and then look at a few particularly important covenants from the Hebrew scriptures. So what is a covenant? Well, a covenant is just a formal agreement, like a contract, uh, between two or more parties. And it's just stipulating, here's what the deal is, right? This deal, it's a contract, it's a covenant. It's something that both parties formally agree to and sign. Like it, today we would sign a contract. Likewise, there are certain ways to sign a covenant or to show a sign that one is committing to this covenant. So in the Hebrew Bible, Hebrew scriptures, there are five centrally important covenants. The covenant with Noah, the covenant with Abraham, the covenant with Moses, the Davidic covenant, and the Jeremiah covenant, or what's, what's more commonly called the New Covenant, the covenant with Jeremiah. So let's look at each one of these in turn, and I'll just read a bit of the scripture for you. So the Noahic covenant, covenant is the covenant really revealed to Noah in Genesis chapter 9, verses 8 through 17. So then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, as for me, I am establishing my covenant with you and your descendants after you and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the domestic animals, and every animal of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark, so the ark of, of Noah, which you're, with which you're probably familiar from pop culture. I establish my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. God said, this is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow, the rainbow, in the clouds, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh and the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it, and I will remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. Interesting, uh, note how many times the, the parties in the covenant are mentioned here. And at every point it's emphasized that the covenant is not just between God and Jewish people or God and humans, but in fact, God and Noah and all living creatures, all every living creature of all flesh. Right? This is the deal, the, the promise that God is making to all living creatures. Now, this the covenant with Noah is, you know, one of the original the original covenant, but it differs quite a bit from some of the later covenants. For one thing, the covenant with Noah is more of a promise made by God than it is a covenant between two parties. The promise is made to all living creatures. The covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. Unlike the other covenants, though, nothing is asked or required of living creatures to receive this. There's only one side to the deal. In other words, God promises not to destroy the world again with water or with a flood and creates a rainbow as the sign of this eternal promise. So what's unique about the Noahic covenant is that it's really just one side. God isn't saying, God isn't asking for anything in return, but just saying, you know, I'm going to, I'm making this deal. I'm not going to destroy the world again through flood. Then a little bit later in Genesis, Genesis chapters 12 through 17, we find another covenant, this time with Abraham. And this is really set up as somewhat of a paradigmatic covenant. So beginning in chapter 15, on that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram. 
saying, to your descendants I give this land. And then the land is described in some detail there, from the river of the Egypt to the great river, the river of Euphrates. So where the boundaries of this particular plot of land are given. God said to Abraham a little bit later, As for you, you shall keep my covenant, and your offspring after you and throughout their generations. This is the covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring af after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. Throughout your generations among every male that shall be circumcised when he is eight days old, so shall my covenant be in your flesh an everlasting covenant. Any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from his people he has broken my covenant. So you can see there's a bit of a word play going on here as far as cutting off skin and cutting off people from, uh, from the covenant. But note that this is, this is more or less of a voluntary covenant, right? God is saying, all right, here's the deal. I will give you this particular plot of land and uh, ensure a number of other things along with that covenant that are promised to Abraham and his descendants, right? His particular family lineage. So it's, it's not with all humans, it's not with all creatures of flesh as it was earlier in the Noahic covenant, but this time only with Abraham and his particular descendants, and even, even more narrowly, only with those descendants of Abraham that choose to partake of this covenant. And in order to partake of this covenant, they have to you know, circumcise the, uh, circumcise their penis. Circum meaning c circum, like circular, like circumnavigate, right? Circum meaning around, like a circle. And size, like scissors, right? To cut, so to cut around, to cut off, so to cut around the, the foreskin of the penis. And then in, in order to cut off the, the sh uh, schmuck, the, the end, the foreskin of the penis. And if one does not cut off that foreskin of the penis, then they are cut off from the covenant, cut off from this deal, right? It doesn't necessarily mean that anything's bad is going to happen to them. It just means, okay, they, they aren't choosing to partake of this particular covenant. So the covenant with Abraham is a formal covenant, a contract requiring something from both parties. The covenant between God and Abraham and all of, bio, of Abraham's biological descendants, at least as the text seems to read, God promises this large parcel of land, which is present-day Israel, as far as we understand it, as well as the prosperity to Abraham's descendants in this land of milk and honey. In exchange, God requires that Abraham and his descendants are circumcised. And then, as a, in order to sign the contract, right, so as if that's not, that circumcision is not complete, it's not all of it. Abraham also has another ritual that he has to perform, and he performs this ritual as his way of um, showing his understanding and his commitment to the deal, right, to the covenant. So he performs this ritual sacrifice that involves some birds and cutting the birds in half and walking through them and a uh, ritual of fire is basically a way to sign the contract and to put the contract into effect. And once that is complete, then God also gives Abram a new name. And he becomes, Abram becomes Abraham and Sarai becomes Sarah. So God clearly states that any male descendant of Abraham that does not keep his end of the agreement will be cut off which simply means that God will not permit them to live in the promised land. So any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his forehead shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. Okay, so now we'll try and go fast forward from Abraham to Moses. So a good deal happens in the rest of Genesis leading up to the Exodus. So Abraham has a son, a couple of sons, first Ishmael and then Isaac. So Abraham has a son named Isaac. God commands Abraham to kill Isaac as a blood sacrifice to God. God demands a number of blood sacrifices throughout the book of Genesis, including, of course, the, the blood sacrifice as part of the covenant with Abraham. As I just mentioned, sacrificing birds and using the blood and the fire and that sort of thing. Also, right from the very beginning, Adam and Eve have, have two children, Cain and Abel, and one offers grain sacrifices and the other offers meat or blood sacrifices. Uh, and God demonstrates uh, God's preference for the blood sacrifices. So here, 
again, God requests this blood sacrifice, but this time asking for Abraham's son, Isaac, as a blood sacrifice. Abraham agrees without any argument. It's interesting because in, in another episode just before this, Abraham argues with God in defense of Sodom and Gomorrah. God wants to destroy all of Sodom and Gomorrah, and Abraham argues, but it's not right to kill righteous people along with unrighteous people, and sort of negotiates a deal in, in defense of, you know, protesting against God. We'll look at more, we'll look at that in a little bit more detail in future episodes, future <laughs> lectures, discussions, whatever we call these things, videos. But here, when God asks Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac, Abraham's like, yeah, all right, word, um, let's go. And so he just goes. He agrees without hesitation, but at the last moment, just before he's about to slit his son's throat in conformity with this voice that he's heard in his head telling him to kill his son, then he hears another voice in his head that says, stop, don't do it. Uh, and instead, there's a ram in the, in the brush, and he sacrifices the ram as a different blood offering to God. When the curtains open, you know I got to rhyme. Philosophy's how I like to spend my time. If you got a minute, let's spit some wisdom. Spread the love, no competition. Some days are dark and the world seems F, but light and hope bring us to the next step. The cave is deep and the struggle's real, but with my homies here, we can start to heal. Then Isaac grows up, and Isaac has twin sons, Jacob and Esau. Now Esau is the firstborn, um, he comes out first. I mean, they're twins, right? So they're born at the same time, but Esau comes out first. And so according to the, the traditions at the time and according to the scriptures, Esau is the rightful heir. But Jacob wants, to, Jacob doesn't think that's fair. And Jacob wants it for himself. And his mom also wants him to have it. So they cook up this little plan. And Jacob goes to his father when his father was very, very older, elderly and unable to see. And he puts on an animal skin and, you know, he performs this little, he play acts, right? He pretends to be his brother. He lies to his father and goes to his father in order to steal his birthright to receive his father's blessing and basically stealing his brother's inheritance while his brother is out trying to, to hunt in order to prepare a meal for his father before his father dies. Esau is out being a dutiful son, trying to, you know, prepare this final meal for his father. And Jacob steals his inheritance. Then Jacob, understandably, gets worried that Esau's not going to like this, right? So he's like, Esau's, Esau's big and brawny and he's, he's a hunter and he's, you know, he's, he's a big, strong, scary dude. And Jacob is more, you know, like, I don't know, like me, maybe. He's not, uh, he's not known, he's, he's wily and he's smart and all those kind of things, but maybe not the, maybe not the most athletic dude, especially compared to his brother. So he fears that his brother's going to kick his ass, basically. So he flees, he runs off into the desert. He leaves his family behind. It's interesting in this uh, in this painting you have here, and in the way it's often described, Jacob and Esau are portrayed as children when they perform this ruse with their mother. But Jacob was married at the time uh, and with children. He leaves his family behind and he runs off into the desert. When he flees out into the desert, worrying that his brother's going to try and kill him, that night someone, it's, the text itself is very unclear who that someone is, but someone appears and wrestles with Jacob uh, until the dawn. In the story, in this particular passage of the text, the person is referred to at one point as a man, another point as an angel or a messenger, and another point directly as God. And this person, whoever it is, ambiguous and unclear as the text makes it, this person then gives Jacob a blessing in exchange for being released. And the, the angel, the being, strikes him, strikes Jacob on the leg in order to get free, to wrestle free, so he walks with a limp. We'll see this again in some of Matisse Yahoo's lyrics uh, in a future video. 
Um, but then the this being, angel, god, man, person, with whom Jacob has wrestled with all night, gives him a new name. And he says, henceforth you shall be known as Israel. Israel. So this is the first time that the word Israel comes up, uh, or at least, you know, this is the origin of the name Israel. El meaning God and Isra, um, so Israel means the one who wrestled with God, the one who struggles with God, the one who wrestled with God. So important, important term, important uh, name. Then fast forwarding again a bit, Jacob, Israel, had 12 sons, the 12 tribes of Israel, 12 tribes of Jacob, and he has a favorite. You know, Joseph is his favorite. Joseph can do no wrong, and he gives Joseph this special coat, a coat of many colors, and the other brothers get jealous. They get jealous because, you know, their brother is, you know, receiving favors. So what they do, they, they take Joseph and they steal his coat and they beat him up and they are going to throw him into a well to, to kill him, right? To, to abandon him in this well. But some Egyptian traders are going by and they think, well, hmm, we could kill our brother or we could sell him. So they sell him to the Egyptian traders and the Egyptians take him back to Egypt because they're like, yeah, as long as you don't, as long as you don't stick around here, you can, you will sell him to you as long as you take him more far away from here. So it takes him to Egypt. And then it turns out that Joseph can predict the future by interpreting dreams. So once Pharaoh figures this out and Joseph starts predicting dreams, then he does this for Pharaoh and predicts uh, famine and great ecological destruction. So he's a bit of a ecologist, I guess you could say, noticing that the climate is changing and that famine and famine and things are coming, that there's going to be a great deal of climate change. And so Pharaoh then takes action in order to prevent that climate change, well not prevent the climate change, but in order to prepare for that, that famine and as a result is able to save the people. Howdy y'all, it's future Brad here, 2022 Brad. Just want to interrupt the video here for a number of reasons. One, it's getting long and it's hard to pay attention for that long. I want you to pay attention to the rest. So, you know, it's good to take a little mental break. Also, we just finished Genesis, so it's a nice time for a break between Genesis and Exodus, 400 years between them anyway. And also to, to give you, as in this form of a mental break, the next thing I'm going to put in the playlist instead of the rest of the lecture on Exodus is this video of excerpt from a film version of Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat, which is a Broadway play by Broadway show by Andrew Lloyd Webber and Tim Rice. And the quality of the video isn't great and all that kind of stuff, but it's only a few minutes long, five minutes long. And I think it really captures, uh, you know, some of what's going on in the, you know, you know, how how Joseph's brothers might feel about him and, you know, what it's like being, you know, one of, you know, on the outs, you know, not the favored son or whatever. Um, so I think it, it it's it's enjoyable. It's a good performance and seems like a good stopping point or good mental break between that and the rest of it and give you a good flavor or sense of the story. Um, so I think it captures a lot of the emotions and that sort of thing all underneath the surface because they're all smiles and Joseph is awesome and everything. But, you know, how would you feel if you were one of the brothers, one of Joseph's brothers uh, in this particular situation? So give it a watch and see what you think and then move on into to the rest of the lecture, which is on Exodus and continuing with the covenants, which is really the main point of the of the lesson.